Good morning, y'all. Thanks so much for coming to join us this early on a Sunday. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be able to moderate a uh, discussion with these like amazing people. I'm so excited. Um, today, we're going to talk about black people versus robots. Um, so we have um, some experts up here who I know have some great insights. Um, so let's just get into the discussion. I'll introduce them first. Um, and there's more information in your booklets or on the app about like their backgrounds. Um, so to my immediate right is Erica Smiley, the co-executive director of Jobs with Justice. <laughs> Next is Professor Catronelle Davis, an associate professor of sociology at Florida State University. <laughs> and then Ann Price, the president of the Insight Center for Community, of Community Economic Development. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, fellow at the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. <laughs> and I'm Jessica Fulton. I'm the Economic Policy Director at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. <laughs> so to get started, um, we're all at this conference thinking about how tech and data may be able to impact black lives for the better. But I'd like to start today with some problem identification. Um, we're gonna talk about how, if left unchecked, research suggests that we may be shifting towards a world where a lot of the jobs held by black folks um, and other people of color and low-income folks are at risk of automation or um, losing wages and work due to technology. Um, so, Professor Davis, can you talk a little bit about how automation may affect black workers and black women workers in particular? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. By all indications, African Americans, black women in particular, um, gained a lot of ground after the 1970s, right? We really came up from those personal service jobs where we were situated for decades, right? We went into health services or healthcare, uh, service sector jobs, in particular retail um, work, transit work, bus drivers, right? I'm going to talk about, very simply, why um, we have reason to fear. First and foremost, all of those um, changes, all of those improvements uh, are subject to basically go away, right? Because those same jobs are the jobs that are, are slated to be uh, automated. Right now, you see department stores, and, and in particular, your Walmarts. You have your checkouts where you, you can do it yourself, right? You can go into McDonald's and you can see um, the BIC uh, machine there where you could make your own order, right? Um, and so it's likely that we're going to see those jobs disappear. The second thing I want to say that's really problematic beyond sort of that structure of opportunity that shifted after the 1970s, beyond that structure sort of, um, or that, that progress going away, we, we also have to deal with the fact that um, automation or the sort of big deal shifts in opportunity, these sort of things aren't new to the labor market. These aren't necessarily new innovations. We've seen these before. Uh, bank tellers, for instance, there's to be more of them. And then we got ATM machines. What did that do? Well, that took away jobs from people who gained access or had access to good paying um, wages, or, or rather wages that could support a, a family. These are the same jobs that were increasingly available to African American women at that time. Same thing, um, telephone operating. We got rid of those jobs, right? And so the situation is that we've been so focused on all of the progress that we've made, but we hadn't really paid attention to the fact that we're already, we've already seen the impact of automation, but it's gone unchecked. We've seen 
Um, and in addition to that, I want to say we've also seen an uptick in worker abuse, um, in voluntary uh, part-time jobs, right? People working out of class or out of their actual position, people not getting their wages. We've seen all of these things essentially go unchecked, right? So that doesn't necessarily position us to have anything to say or do to the situation that we're looking at when, when we're thinking about um, robots taking over the jobs. Third thing I'll bring up is the fact that, again, this is happening right before our eyes. And as a sociologist, I just wouldn't be doing my job if I, if I didn't speak on the fact that we are being sensitized to accept this adjustment in the labor market, right? We're not doing anything about it. We're not really as a people saying much about it, although the transportation industry, they put so much money into this particular um, innovation. And now they're doing research on how it's going to impact people, right? And so, but all of this is happening right in front of us. So this has to lead you to think, what are we going to think about those workers who lose their positions? Will they lose their positions because of you know, because they're lazy? Will we be led to think that? Will we be led to think that they lost their positions because they lack personal responsibility, right? Because if we are, we won't be positioned to do anything that could systematically change what, what people are confronting. Um, and I'll end by saying this. We think that this is a low skill, entry level position situation. Think again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Turnerly, I know you've done a lot of work on this um, skills piece. Can you talk a little bit about what industries or kind of sectors that we should be thinking about or like how quickly are these changes coming? Just can you give us a little bit more insight on the tech? Um, yes, I'll give insight. First of all, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, this is an interesting conversation because when I was a little kid, I used to rush home to watch this show called The Jetsons. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And I never in a million years would have thought that I'd be talking about this today, OK? Um, because it has come. The robots have come. Automation has changed the way that we actually look at sectors. Uh, before I look at what sectors are changing, I just do want to follow up on a quick comment of what has previously been said. I think we all have to understand from a general perspective of the economy that we're now looking at 22% of uh, digital resources or parts of the digital economy sort of feeding into the national economy. The Bureau of Economic Analysis says that we're at 6.5% of growth of digital industries. And when we look at digital industries, we somehow think of just Uber and Airbnb and the digital shared economy. We're talking about things that go back to mainframe related support, IT general support, supplier chain, et cetera. So what to, as a sociologist as well, what's interesting is that we're actually seeing the economy shift. With regards to that, we're also seeing, I think, this wave of disruptive technologies or disruptive industries. Uh, transportation being one of them. Uh, I am a tech geek at Brookings. That's all I do is look at tech stuff. We're looking at autonomous vehicles coming down the pipe. We're looking at artificial intelligence sort of moving the nature. I was up this morning, and I swear, ladies and gentlemen, there is going to be an AI treadmill, OK, which is going to learn the way that I exercise, which will probably be very bad. But, um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, those are disrupting technologies. Grocery stores are being disrupted in terms of the self-checkout kiosk. People knowing what algorithms are changing the way that our purchasing behaviors are, knowing what we buy before we buy it and delivering it to our door. All of those are disrupting, I think, legacy industries where African Americans have traditionally worked. And so when we look at what, where are we going to be affected, it's going to be in those places like Detroit with the automotive industry. It's going to be in places where African Americans have been unfairly um, aggregated when it comes to service sector jobs. Uh, we saw a little bit of this. I don't want anybody in this room to think that this is a new phenomenon. With every industrial revolution, there is a shifting and a change and a dislocation of workers. The difference here, and I'll just I'll do my comments and, and keep it brief, uh, is that we'll see an upside and a downside. Let me start with the downside first. 
with African Americans and other people of color in particular, we see them on the other side of the digital divide. That's a problem. There are 11 million Americans today that do not have digital access, believe it or not. They are predominantly people of color, they are low income, they are foreign born, they are seniors, and they are people that live in rural communities. If you sit on the other side of the digital divide, I have a book coming out called Digitally Invisible. What happens is you lose access to the resources, the intuitive resources of what smartphones can provide and formal digital literacy training. So when you begin to think about how do we integrate people into this disruptive, growing digital economy, we're already starting behind because we sit on the wrong side of the divide. We're experiencing the effects of not having technology within classrooms of young people. We're living in communities where we don't have access to digital resources and training to actually be reskilled. That's a problem. On the upside, however, it does not mean that just because we're going to autonomous vehicles that we're actually going to be driving air. Let me say it again. <laughs> there still has to be a physical shell. And with regard to that, I tell people Nordstrom's a couple of years ago announced that they were going to a virtual dress store. I was like, well, somebody got to still make the dresses. <laughs> somebody still has to make the clothes. And so there's been this conversation, I think, in this automation in the future of robots and robots taking over that we've sort of missed the mark with regards to where people who are disadvantaged are going to fit. There is going to be the need for workers. I'm really amazed, for example, by Amazon. I can order whatever I want on Amazon at whatever time. The algorithm will deliver me products. But there is somebody who shows up at my door in a vehicle with a physical body that puts the package in front of my house. You see where I'm going with this? And so I think there's a discussion of where do we fit. The unfortunate thing, and I'll end here, is that where we might fit is still where we are on low-skilled wage work. And that's the challenge. You're looking at one-fifth or 22% of the economy is driven by digital. But still, African-American, Hispanic, and other people of color will still be at the bottom. Some of that will be attributed to who works in Silicon Valley today that is doing this automation. Less than 2 to 3% of decision makers that work at the top companies that are re-engineering and disrupting industry don't look like me. So they're not hiring me. That's a problem. The second piece is, if I live in communities where I do not have access to the skilling, then I won't be a, an engineer, a coder, a robotic specialist, an AI engineer, because guess what? I'm already on the wrong side of the educational trajectory and the social mobility trajectory. So as a sociologist myself and the work that I do, we're trying to figure out how do you actually converge these realities so that you see where there are industry opportunities, it's not at the bottom of the scale of those opportunities. People today are making really good money disrupting the national and global economy. But those people aren't us. And so you've got to go back and you've got to look at those industries of scale and make demands on where we want to fit. So I'll leave it there because I got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's Sunday, I'm supposed to be in church, but I'm going to preach to y'all. That's what I have a lot to say. Um. I really appreciate that, and I think you touched on something that I think is really important. In America, we've been really good at, people in power have been really good at not paying black people for their work. Mm -hmm. So slavery, sharecropping, like getting into care work jobs that are not covered by any kind of protection. That's what um, those Amazon delivers. Amazon, exactly. Um, so, and I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about how these how these trends in automation and growing technology relate to how the labor market treats black workers generally, how we've done it historically, and, and kind of um, how should we think about these issues in the context of a country that's kind of been built on anti-blackness? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll pick up a little bit on what Dr. Um, Dr. Davis, doctor. Doctor, two doctors <laughs> beside me, <laughs> and a doctor sandwich here, um, <laughs> talked about, and just with a little example, because to understand that this really isn't new. So when you mm -hmm. think about sharecropping and what happened and using Detroit as an example, you know, it wasn't just that six million black folks picked up and left and decided that they were not going to anymore tolerate the kind of oppression and violence that they were experiencing. In fact, probably by the 50s, 
those blacks would have had to leave anyway, right? Because a couple of things were happening. When you think about the mixture of kind of technological advances and automation um, and government policies that really pushed blacks out of the South and, and, and forced them north and other places, right? So in one sense, you had something like, you know, blacks used to pull weeds, you know, and that was some of their work. And then, you know, there were chemicals that, defoliants, that were able to kill weeds and that ended jobs, right? We think about the invention of the tractor that infected the way that blacks worked. Um, and so there were a number of innovations that forced blacks um, off of the land and into different jobs. So if you think about those that went north and went to Detroit, for example, um, and this idea, and I think about my own family and people in Detroit, and we thought about, wow, they had these great jobs and they were working in the audio, auto industry. And for some time, I mean, blacks still struggle to get into certain jobs in the rubber industry and the auto industry, um, but we're making their way into that industry at a time when all blue co collar workers were losing jobs. You think about over 1.5 million people losing jobs at that time. So there was some headway that was made, um, but as soon as blacks got a somewhat of foothold in that industry, it started to change very rapidly. And you saw a huge decline in the ability to, 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 find, to work. Um, and what we were really seeing at that time, if you think about even like one, industry, one auto, automaker like Dodge, where most of those workers, as those, some of those workers became more heavily African-American, you saw conditions worsen, you saw that they were really relegated to low wage work, and you know, the workers themselves called this negromation, right? Um, and and it, so you really start to see this kind of still concentration in certain types of jobs. Um, I think for, for me, and, and I will just say this too, this really started a 40 year decline. You know, by 1964, black unemployment was around 12.4%. Um, whites around 5.9%. And from that time on, you saw this double, what we know that black unemployment is usually double that of whites. And you saw that trend that started in 1964 and we see it to this day. But I think for me, the real issue and the concern that, that I have is really is around how we're relocated and slotted into certain jobs. Um, and you just picked up on that, right? So this thing about occupation, we call it occupational crowding, and that is mm -hmm. kind of the unnatural packing of people in different types of jobs. We at Insight are looking at, at this and working with folks in Mississippi, for example, on this very issue. And when you look at how people are packed into jobs and how blacks are packed into jobs, we're finding, for example, that 53% um, of black men, about 62% of black women are packed into certain jobs, meaning that they are really cut out of a range of occupations, right? Um, particularly black women. Black women are particularly crowded into certain types of work that tends to be low paying, and we're talking about an average of about 10.50 an hour. Um, and when we look across uh, even the spectrum of, of education, blacks who are still highly educated are also unnaturally packed into jobs either paid at the lower end of those jobs or packed into jobs where there's not really much advancement. So when we think about the fact that some of this is about automation, some of it's about really growing technology, where are we going to end up, what jobs will we be packed into, whether we have a great deal of education or not, is really the question that we need to be answering and focusing on right now. Yep, yep. Thanks so much. Yep. This is a lot. Um, <laughs> we're gonna add to it. Um, so, Smiley, I have a, I have a question. What can we look forward to? Is there is there anything that we can do? <laughs> is, there right? <laughs> is there is there is this going to benefit us in any way? Is technological change is all like gloom and doom for Black folks. What right. Can we, what can we? Do? I love your question. <laughs> so well thought out. Uh, <laughs> it's the perfect question for this panel, actually, um, because I think a lot of our opposition, a lot of people in power want us to feel like it's inevitable and, and kind of just get over it. 
uh, and that's, that's actually not true. Um, so good morning, it's great to be here. <laughs> I, I'm actually like totally, I've got talking points, but I'm totally enwrapped by my right. uh, co-panelists. I really appreciate uh, the last couple of remarks that uh, Anne made. Uh, you know, so, so automation is like an age old thing, right? This is something that's, in fact, just a quick test. Who knows the, the origination of the word sabotage? Huh? It was like it was like French. Oh, you know it. Okay, okay. One guy. Bless your heart. Tell me if I'm wrong. All right. So it's like uh, it's like two people. Two people. Um, it was French workers. They were they were garment workers and uh, working at at looms. And and the employer started bringing in these mechanical looms. And at the time, this is like maybe 250, 300 years ago. They were, they wore wooden shoes called sabots. Sabot. I don't know. I don't speak French. It's you know some sabot. Sabo, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they got mad at the, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm probably very offensive. Uh, and they got, they got mad, you know, they were like, these machines are going to replace our jobs. And they threw their, their sabot into the, the mechanical looms and stopped them. They sabotaged uh, production. Uh, and so automation is actually a thing that happens. And what it really is, is, is really new technology, right? And we aren't scared of new technology. New technology is great. When you put it that way, we're like new technology. We're scared of old technology. Who, who wants to use, like, the C prompt? DOS <laughs> computer system. Anyone? Anyone? No, of course not, right? So when you look at new technology and we think about automation, what we're actually saying is uh, employers and companies and capital using new technology to increase productivity and, and decrease costs at the same time in efforts to increase their own profits, right? And so in that sense, the question is who benefits? Not a question of stopping it, right? We aren't trying to just throw our sabot into the mechanical loom. We're trying to actually benefit from that new shift in efficiency, that new increased productivity, that new money, right? So getting back to uh, what you were sharing earlier about the uh, you know, enslavement and our history of black workers, right? How many people want to go back? You want those, those cotton picking jobs? <laughs> Anyone? No? Right, that's, that's cool, we don't want these cotton picking jobs, right? <laughs> but if you were able to get your 40 acres and a mule through the form of a broader safety net, through, through better health care, through coverage, you would take that, right? We would actually want to benefit from those things. So I think at the end of the day when we're talking about is there hope, um, the question that we're trying to actually answer is uh, who benefits and how do we buy for the, uh, the rewards for the goods that are going to come from this new technology? And of course, I work with, with Jobs with Justice, and, and we say that when workers are organized, and they can organize through unions, or, or you know, there are more uh, recent modern forms of organizing as well, where they can actually buy and contest for power, contest for who benefits with the employer, with capital, with the government, in a way that allows us to benefit from technology. A couple quick examples, and I'll stop. Certainly, people have brought up Detroit, uh, and there are examples where the union wasn't strong or wasn't united or uh, certainly wasn't listening to the black workers mm -hmm. who were uh, lifting things up. And the plant would close and then move to another location that was, you know, completely left black workers asked out, right? But then there are other instances in automation, particularly in, say, electricity, like in general uh, GE, where the United Electrical Workers were actually able to see the automation coming and negotiate around it. Negotiate, say, okay, well, if we're going to move, introduce this new technology, then what we're going to do is everyone gets to keep their job. We get to work less. We get to make the same amount, right? And we actually get to negotiate over the safe implementation of the new technology. Now, that's a completely different thing. And it was funny because I hadn't thought about it. I was still in the is there hope phase. <laughs> and then one of my colleagues was like, well, you know, we've been through three. I don't know why anyone won't just call us. I mean, we've been through three phases of automation in the 30 years that I've been there, and, and it, it's been great because they actually had organization. They built power, and they were able to buy for, for the shifts that were made. So I think at the societal level, as black people, but also as people in general, because actually the demands of black workers, we're really just canary in the coal mine. They're at the demand of everyone at the end of the day, right? And so part of what we have to do at a societal level is constantly ask this question of who benefits, mm -hmm. right? Is it automation in the benefit of just like a small select few in the, in the benefit of Jeff Bezos at Amazon with this drone research. He's trying to get rid of your driver too, just so you know. Uh, in, the, in the benefit of Rob Walton and Greg Penner, is it automation in the benefit of them? Or is it automation that's actually gonna allow us to have a stronger social safety net, more time with our families, more recreation, in, in a way that's gonna allow us to actually be whole as a, as a society. So I'll stop there.
Thank you. So we might be able to do this. Okay. Um, <laughs> we might make it. Um, I really like to hear, since we've gotten started a little bit on the solutions, can, can the rest of the panel kind of talk about um, how you can make it so that black workers benefit from these changes? Yeah, I mean, I'll start. I think there's, um, and I love, again, all the comments. I'm feeling a lot of love for the panelists up here because this is a really complicated question. Um, I think the way that we look at it is we're doing some of the stuff now. I mean, when Obama was in office, he put out the computer science for all to fill the big void that's going to be created by the lack of computer scientists, right? 2020, 1.4 million jobs will be uh, looking for skilled scientists to actually come and work there. The purpose of this conference in terms of data scientists world, the percentage of, of the supply and demand is just gonna be off. So there's this track that actually still needs to happen where coding still needs to be a second language for young people. Robotics still needs to happen for young people. Notice the key word is young people. We still have to create a pipeline that's actually going to go into these jobs on the creation side. I am not concerned about how much people consume of technology. I'm not. I'm more concerned with the growth of the app economy, the growth of these areas where people are in the production side of the business versus just the consumption side. But then I think there's also this adult level that has sort of gone unspoken. What do you do with adult workers who are going to be dislocated? Um, as a person in Washington, D.C., which is not a great place to work right now, mm -hmm. what I would actually say to that is that we need to do more upskilling. There is this opportunity to take adults and to train them differently. What's different about the automotion, automation economy, which I think we should be paying attention to, it's not necessarily the skills that you have, it's the way that you manage. You know, I think about my mother who was a teacher for 30 years. Could she actually manage remotely? Could she actually manage with virtual assistance? Does she know what it's like to have a dispersed uh, and collaborative workload? Those are new skills that I think African-American workers need to be exposed to that we have not taken before. Occupational skills, workforce development skills. When I was high school, they taught us typing. They taught us how to be teachers. But today's economy is going to force people to learn how to be fluid managers and much more agile in how they do business. And that, I think, is really going to be challenging for black folks who work their way into companies that had a rigid nine to five job. I remember when I first went to Brookings, because I've worked in civil rights all my life with, with uh, African-American organizations. <laughs> I used to get to work at 8 o'clock before everybody got there. And I used to want to leave right at 5 and not leave any time before. And everybody in my office was kind of leaving, because they're all scholars. They're like, what you still doing here? <laughs> <laughs> no lie. I would go up to the people and say, I'm going to leave now. They're like, why do you keep asking us if you got to leave? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I thought that's what people do when they work nine to five, right? <laughs> Particularly in a predominantly white organization. I don't want to get written up, right? <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, and I'm old, you know, and I'm still acting that way. But what I'm saying is we got to break that mentality among adult workers, where this will be a challenging culture shift. And I think less conversation has been placed on those jobs that are going to require much more agility in how you work. And so I think when we have these conversations around the future of work, let's just not talk about, well, what slots are going to be created for people. Let's talk about management skills. Let's talk about, you know, being the Amazon driver who makes your own hours. What does that look like to have forced productivity in this new environment where people want things in real time? So just things like that, I think, are some of the solutions that we in Washington, D.C. should be thinking about as well. We look to invest in workforce development programs. Let's just not focus on just teaching the babies. Let's focus on getting the adults also transitioned. Mm -hmm. oh. Anyone else have thoughts? I have a few. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I would really like to talk about those workers who may not gain access to that specialized training. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, there are inst instances where um, in U.S. history we've made um, policy shifts or we've passed policy right. to support people who are structurally unemployed. That means that essentially you have a skill, but they're not paying you for it anymore, right? And so late 19... Um, 70s, they came up with a targeted job tax credit, which is now the work opportunity tax credit. That tax credit is all about supporting or the U.S. government uh, helping employers pay for workers who are structurally unemployed. Initially, it was those people who um, were uh, had uh, 
prison histories, um, um, 80s uh, um, warfare history, just had difficulties gaining access to, to jobs. Now um, these funds, when they're right. authorized, they are used to pay for veterans, et cetera. We need to push mm -hmm. for people who will be um, structurally unemployed to get that type of support. We also need to push for people who are structurally un unemployed to gain access to free college education. Um, the state of Michigan, when um, um, I think in the early 2000s, they were paying for workers who were structurally unemployed That's right. to gain access to um, college education, um, community college. This is all very, very important. Last thing I'll say, um, there are also things that happen in the workplace that undermine people's capacity to keep their jobs, like involuntary part-time labor, mm -hmm. right? And so when that initially was introduced in a transit industry, uh, transit unions were especially um, helpful in making sure that um, transit companies could not, you know, sort of overcome the, or overwhelm the workforce or workplace with part-time labor. It could only be 20% or 30 percent, et cetera, we need to be, you know, we need to be mindful of what's happening and we need to be clear about how the labor unions are responding. Right. Well, this is, this is uh, just to pick up on this point of the labor unions, this is actually an incredible, uh, incredibly important point because, again, the level of which any sector or company is organized, the level of which workers are able to come together and buy for power with their employer, that will actually determine who benefits long term, whether it's just them or all of us. So building on the transit example, you know, one of the things that the, the ATU, the Amalgamated Transit Union in Ohio was able to negotiate when they were beginning to test automated buses was, all right, well, you still need someone on the bus to make sure it stops in the case of an emergency or in a case of a malfunction. Like those jobs still need to exist. There is a question of, of negotiating to keep the new skill sets within the existing bargaining unit, within the existing staff. And so uh, if we actually shift culturally to say that regardless of the new technology, if the priority is to make sure that, you know, in addition to uh, uh, retention of jobs, that the goal is to prioritize the existing employee, employees, the existing labor base to actually implement the new technology, then there's a different posture because that person on the bus, okay, so uh, he or she may not be driving, but they are still providing a very important function. And, and this gets to, um, uh, how many of you have seen Hidden Figures? You remember mm -hmm. Octavia Spencer's character with the computers, mm -hmm. the original computers, which were people that actually computed, mm -hmm. and then they brought in the, the, the robot computer, mm -hmm. and she studied and figured out, like, th that, that was actually a really great example of what it actually looks like in real life, oftentimes spearheaded by unions, who in, in many instances are the ones pushing for new technology because it's safer, because the old technology is clumsy, because it's not effective or efficient. Right? But to actually make sure that the new technology is in the, new, in the existing workforce is trained to implement it. And then to use that to then say, well, now we are, are higher skilled, we have more skills, and to buy for higher wages and higher standards, conditions, to be marketable or to, to demand a, a higher market wage. Um, so like the, the last thing I want to say without going into all the different uh, Contract. Actually, I have two more things. I'm sorry. I'm Southern <laughs> from North Carolina. You're gonna have to stop. You have to cut me off. But uh, <laughs> there are two more things I want to say. The 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 first one is there are some jobs that shouldn't be automated, which I think right. I think is obvious. But we're gonna have to like be obvious about it just to make sure, right? Like there, you know, the jobs that deal with people, public service jobs, uh, uh, healthcare, education, right? No one wants a robot teacher. Like we have to, to really assert that and to actually assert them as important skills and jobs for humans and people to have and that are valued and are paid well, right? Like, uh, like my colleague is saying here. Um, but the last thing I wanna say in, in all of this, and we, we talk about worker power, but we don't talk about uh, exactly what that means. It's kind of an abstract term, right? And, and for us at Jobs with Justice, we're talking about the ability of workers to be able to come together and collectively bargain, not just in the traditional sense that unions in the U.S. Have, have done it, but to be able to overall govern our work site or govern our industry, right? It's almost like a, a policy or a contract is essentially a policy for a work site or for a company that we can then implement and grieve 
right, and execute. It's just like the law in society. And so we want to be able to collectively negotiate the conditions of each of our work sites. But we do that based on power. And, and according to my favorite uh, theoretician around this, Beverly Silver, there are really three forms of power that black workers will have to pay attention to. And not paying attention to this will potentially be our downfall as well as the entire you know, workforce and working <laughs> class. Right? Again, our issues are really just like at the front of what for everyone else. It's not just black workers. Um, the first one is uh, uh, workplace power and the ability to stop production, most notoriously seen in the auto, uh, auto industry in Detroit. So when you have a labor force that's not skilled, the ability to stop work is actually the thing that we use to vie for power and contend for those benefits at the end of uh, any automation cycle. And so like my colleague uh, Dr. Cole was saying uh, a few minutes ago when we're looking at the garment industry, okay, you know, Macy's or whoever it was may be able to automate their dress department. Right, without but the virtual there's a, there, Yeah, there's a yep. massive garment industry right. in, uh, in southern Asia, in Ethiopia, that, right. that can't be automated, right? Minus those mechanical looms that, you know, we threw our sabal, right? So, um, so that's the first one. The second one is marketplace power, which we see most often with the construction trades, right? This is the ability to control a skill set. And what sometimes happens, the reason I'm saying these things is because when new technology comes or a cycle of automation comes, it changes the way that we can exercise power in the context of a company. And if we're trying to exercise power like we still are controlling a skill set, when in fact we've been de-skilled like the postal workers were over the, over the last 30 years, then we actually need to shift, right? Otherwise, we don't actually have that power and we're not going to we aren't going to benefit. Right? But can I can I just yeah. and I don't want to break protocol. I just want to bring one <laughs> quick, quick thing protocol. quick thing in though. <laughs> I, I think the challenge though, and I love everything that we're talking about, right? But the challenge in the automated economy is decentralization, right? And so there's a lot of conversations. It's happening in the U.S. It's happening in China. It's happening all over the world in terms of workers that are decentralized. Your Uber driver is a decentralized worker, sure. right? Those workers that do not have uh, collective bargaining power do not have a central office to actually check into, are without, uh, you know, they're not subjected because of their independent status to overtime rules and what's actually required in terms of that. I worry that that part where people of color will be mostly con aggregated mm -hmm. is going to implode. And we're going to be, see the effects in many respects in terms of taxes, in terms of, you know, wait, wait, so balance you of quality of life. You know, I, I just think that we, are all taking advantage of the privileges and conveniences that these ride sh these digital sharing economy apps and all this other stuff affords, mm. but those workers are not protected. No, and at a certain, and I, I want true. us to talk about that because I think that's the part in terms of decentralization of what technology has done that is going to keep workers much more vulnerable. No, that is true. Yeah. That is true. But it is not inevitable mm -hmm. that it will implode because I think that number number one, there are a lot of actually fantastic examples in this day and age of workers who are in situations like that, Uber specifically, right, right. who are organizing and organizing in a different way. Not organizing the way, say, cab drivers organized in the 70s in New York, because it's a different situation, mm -hmm. right? But actually using online applications like the Work It app, which the organization United for Respect has developed, a platform to basically know what your rights are, whether they are in a contract, right. in a personnel policy, or vaguely dispersed over different cities to be able to grieve certain things in a different way. What ultimately allows us to grieve things is not a contract, it's the power that we have behind it. That's what's up. Mm -hmm. And right. so the third power, which I, which I didn't get to, was associated because of the broken, pro the breach of protocol. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I know, right? We, I'm sorry, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> we're, just we're just having a good time up here. Uh, is, a, is associational power, yeah, right? Yeah. And, which is, you know, through, through voting or consumer power, or the ability to actually aggregate or, in labor terms, amalgamate right. a workforce. And that may not look like the way that we amalgamated workforces in the 1930s when all the textile and garment workers were able to come together literally in one place. Right, right. It looks like how we would amalgamate in, a, in the digital age. Right. It might actually be a very different way. And there are different experience, uh, experiments and experiences with this. I'm not gonna claim that one is better than the other because it's way too soon to tell. But you know, the example of New York saying, actually, no, these uh, you can't say that these are independent contractors. They do have the right to organize if they want to. Or Seattle saying, all right, well, let's create a completely separate labor system and set of protections for independent contractors, yeah, if you want to call them independent yeah. contractors. Mm -hmm. So clearly, the point is how workers organize and the power that they recognize that they have in any given moment is what's going to ultimately determine 
which of us benefits from this. Bring us back okay. in our order. <laughs> and do you have thoughts that you want to add? Well, um, I'm looking at the time. I, I um, want to say when you are around brilliant people, it leaves you with very little to say at the end. Um, <laughs> And, and I won't reclaim my time. I'll give up my time. I want the audience. I want the audience to be able to ask questions. I I, I was actually going to get into a whole thing about UBI, which may seem like a little off in this conversation. So I won't do that. I do think that. Um, well, I kind of will. Um, yeah, yeah, just go ahead. Man, you might as well. You might as well, girl. Go for it. And since we don't have a lot of time, I just want to make two, uh, maybe three, really, really quick points. One is, is really is the, this, this idea of governance and who's going to have a seat at the table um, and who's going to have the power around what decisions are being made. I think that's just clearly one of the biggest things we have to think about and how, how we think about worker power and everything that Smiley just said. Um, I think this emphasis on automation and it's tied to a UBI is something that we have to reject wholeheartedly as people of color, as black people. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in, engaged in the issue of e UBI for the past year and a half now, and really saying we need a whole new narrative, a whole new framework, not a tech bro. Um, the robots are coming as a, as a means to support UBI, um, particularly for people who themselves have you know, very poor worker conditions in their companies. Um, we need a whole new framing around the idea of, of agency, of promoting social freedom, of the idea of dignity and, and, and our, our, our worth as a discussion about UBI. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that we can talk about in terms of what undergirds our ability to work, which is having um, a robust kind of you know, way to deal with unemployment and structural discrimination uh, and, and having some kind of social safety net, which is almost really, it's eroded, not just eroded, it's almost non-existent in this country today. And how can UBI open up a whole nother discussion about a truth and reconciliation in this country around structural racism? That's where we should be, that's what we should be talking about. <laughs> And that's what I'd love to see us as, as people who, who are people of color, of black, as black people who care about structural racism. We can take this to a whole nother kind of discussion. So I'll just stop there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just open that up. <laughs> Leave it. Up. Got it. Um, so um, since UBI is such a big, buzzy policy idea, we know that um, Mayor Tubbs in Stockton has a pilot that's going to be happening. Senator Harris has a plan that's basically like an expanded earned income tax credit that people are calling close to a universal basic income. Um, supporters say that offering some base level of cash to people across the population is going to be what um, kind of maintains people with some base level of I don't, uh, living standards. Um, but there's a lot of opposition, right? And there are a lot of reasons why people might oppose something like this. Can we talk a little bit more about um, where we see the problems are, where there, where there are opportunities to make um, tweaks to make this something that works for black folks. I feel like I'm reminded of like the Chappelle show <laughs> when people start handing out cash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, that's fine. Well, I, I'll be brief because I want you to speak more about it. I feel like I really, uh, a lot of the stuff that you were saying really resonates with me uh, and, and the, the two points that I wanted to add to that is, is that UBI outside of the context of a social safety net is really letting employers off the hook. Exactly. Why are you just like, you, these are wages they can afford to pay and should be paying. They're right. Um, and then secondly, uh, just just to really build on what Ann was saying, is that uh, part of, of a wage is also part of the dignity of work. Like there is actually a cultural phenomenon where we need to really respect the value that people feel and get from their work. Most workers don't say I'm a worker or I work for, or maybe they'll say I work for AT&T. Most workers say things like, you know, I'm a construction, I build things, or I make things, or I take care of children. And there's a dignity in that. Right. There's a dignity in that that has to be valued, not just throw cash at it because, you know, the employers don't want that. So I think, and again, I want to hear mm -hmm. Ann's proposals because I actually think there's a lot in there. but. This question of, of what a universal basic income is actually a question of what is the social safety net we need in this day and age. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the thing about it is, is that some of the questions around what this 
can replace and it lets employers off the hook. I don't think that's the way that I would see a productive UBI um, being crafted. And I don't think it's really the narrative. I think the narrative that we want to have in the public discourse. I mean, it is dominating and I think it's really not the right question, right? And it's not some total replacement of a social safety net. It's not that. To me, it's about people having the agency and freedom to make the decisions that they want to make about their families in the way that they know best. And right now, we have a social safety net that totally extracts, it totally dictates someone's life. There is no real freedom in, in being able to make a decision about, about your life. I think the issue of dignity is one that dignity should not have to be earned. We should, be, we should have dignity because we exist, and that's a whole nother kind of conversation. I, I think if we really understand what the, the narrative is around work and workers in this country, particularly black workers, it would drive us to some other ways that we think about this. So just very, very quickly, we've studied at Insight really how Americans think about, about work and economic well-being. And basically, in this country, people believe that you are not a full person, that you are not a fully humanized person unless you work. And when I say work, because a lot of people work, and they're not getting paid for it. Right. People who care for elders and children are working. The thing is that in this country, people believe that to go from a fully like immature human being to a realized person, you have to work. But only some people want to work. So when you look at these tropes of laziness, uh, and, and this is really just brought up on their own, just not unprompted, saying, well, you know what? Black people don't really want to work, right? Mm -hmm. They're lazy. I mean, you could, you could, and these are just common tropes that we've heard since slavery that still exist and define how we think about work, who works, and how they should work. And that affects everything. That affects all the policies we're talking about. It, it, it affects bargaining power because of people's value and their worth. So the idea, I think, for people to say, let's decouple that, you know, let's not say that this has to be tied to people and personhood as work, but the fact that we're all deserve dignity and we deserve the right to make decisions about our families. That is what people are trying to get at with some of this conversation that just keeps getting pulled back into automation. It's saying you're not, you're not for workers, you're, giving people, you're letting employers off the hook. And I don't think it has to be that way, but I think that a lot of the discourse has, has moved us in that direction. So um, I'll, I'll be quick. You know, first and foremost, I think we reject any, uh, any type of conversation that imposes pathology on black people. Mm -hmm. That is rejected. Okay, I'm a sociologist. I was trained in that. And I think the, you're correct that we should not be looking at black people. I, I actually haven't heard black people lazy in the same sentence in a long time. So I obviously have a really good circle of friends and people I hang out with because <laughs> we don't talk like that. You know, but I, I want to actually take us back, though, to automation because I think it is a real concern. I mean, I think we do have to look at the general picture of historically how African Americans have been, uh, you know, the relationship of African Americans at work, where we have been going back to the original part of the conversation from sharecropping to where we are now. The bottom line in permissionless innovation is that the train has left the station. Mm -hmm. Technology is here. And African Americans are over indexing in the use of social media. How many of you in here own patents on Facebook? Just raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you own patents with Twitter? How many of you own patents on Instagram? Now, how many of you have accounts on all three of those? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying, right? So we are making millions and billions of dollars for these companies right now. And they are using our data, using our preferences, using our location to get richer. Mm -hmm. And so in many respects, it was something I saw on Instagram the other day that said, you know, forget about your job. You already made people millionaires <laughs> because you actually use the product, right? And so we've got to actually change the paradigm for how people fit within this technology economy. Mm -hmm. When I started technology 20 years ago, we said that the internet was the lowest uh, hanging fruit for people to start businesses. That dream has come true. The app economy has created a lot of blog sites that have morphed into products and services. What has happened somewhere along the line as we have these conversations about the future work is that we have placed people of color in marginalized positions outside of this economy. Mm -hmm. Somebody said earlier, what would happen if we stop purchasing? We have not been able to solve yet what would happen if all of us in this room stopped using Google. Mm -hmm. 
What would happen if all of us stopped using these products and services? What if we demanded tech diversity in these companies? Mm. We've not gotten there yet. And so I would just mm. say, as we have this conversation on the technology's disruption of economies, of scale, that we have to sort of say, it is a bigger picture of where we fit within the ecosystem, but we also have to sort of think about how do we make demands on these industries of scale to say enough is enough. We have the right to participate because we actually are the consumers of a lot of these products and services. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what keeps me up at night, the fact that I'm making people richer and richer. I'm not going to say what company is less. I'm, say, I'm not going to say what company I went to visit because at Brookings, we go to a lot of corporate companies, a lot of social media companies, a lot of tech companies. All I have to say is I said, I don't want to buy this product anymore because this building is big, it's white, and it's much more than, I mean, my, my little purchase and my little device <laughs> compared to what they built, that's a lot. And for the first time in my life, I realized I was making that company richer without being rich myself. And all I'm saying is if we start to actually acknowledge the fact that we have to change the relationship of how black people are uh, relating to the technology disruption that is ultimately going to place them online and not in line, we'll have a different conversation of where they fit within the scope of work. That's all I, and automation. We cannot, it, it's gone. The train is already in New York. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get back to DC. That plane is already over DC. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm saying, it is left. No, you know, we've got to stop telling people that, you know, we gotta, we've got to demand our space there or else we're going to continue to have people consuming the products, making these companies richer. And, it, and, and it's true, Nicole, because part of what we're, we're saying and part of what I'm saying when we define work is not defining work as in who you work for. That's it. Right? But actually mm -hmm. defining who you're helping to create wealth for, yeah. which doesn't always mean that you're paid mm -hmm. and doesn't always look like an actual employment employ, employer employee situation, right? Uh, and so when we talk about uh, dignity and uh, respect, it's really about, I guess I was raised Presbyterian, I can't believe I'm doing this, my mom would be so proud, <laughs> works, right? right. Like mm -hmm. what people work. feel like their works are. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, when we think about um, the future of work, really it's, it's um, the way that it's being discussed amongst different elite uh, communities is completely absent of people, mm -hmm. which is kind of bizarre. Yeah. Um, we really need to be thinking about the future of workers mm -hmm. and what working people are, how working people are going to evolve given the new technology and shifts in the global economy. And then for us, it's also about the, the future of bargaining because when I said, you know, when I talk about collective bargaining, a lot of times that's thought of in the traditional sense of employer employee relationship and you get a contract and you have a good union job. But that's not the only place that we should be able to negotiate and govern ourselves and to negotiate with capital. A tenant should be able to negotiate with uh, building owners, like in New York, where there actually there's a Crown Heights Tenants Union that's working with a, a workers union, and the workers are negotiating in those buildings, and, and the tenants are trying to negotiate with capital around the, the rents, and, and they're both trying to win contracts, but they aren't going to be a union in the traditional right. sense, but they are going to be negotiating with capital. These are the, the adjustments to the new situation, whether it, we're talking about the Uber drivers who are decentralized, or uh, people who are, are in a different relationship to, to capital that may not be a, a traditional employment relationship. Part of what we're arguing is that people are valued, that they have the ability to govern simply because they are, mm -hmm. like Ann said, because they're there and they experience it, and that we need to be able to infuse life and energy into the organizing that will allow them to assert that with capital. So we have about 30 minutes left. I want to open it up for questions. Um, there are people with mics and they will choose who to go to because this is a lot of pressure. <laughs> Hi, I really appreciate the comments from the panelists and thank you. So my question is, as far as the rhetoric and the push in the past couple of years to get more coders, and they specifically use the term coders because they're not necessarily saying programmers mm -hmm. or developers mm -hmm. or computer scientists, mm -hmm. but coders. And so I wanted to ask the panelists about the um, inherent, what will happen is feminization, ghettoization mm -hmm. of these positions mm -hmm. where people are sold that, oh, you'll make at least $65,000 a year, but we know that when certain people enter certain parts of the workforce, right. that oh, all of that, the, the prestige and the uh, possibilities for salary decrease. So I wanted to know uh, what you all think about that um, and how we can change, perhaps, 
that both the rhetoric surrounding who needs to enter the force and the um, way that tech, particularly, but all kinds of jobs, when certain people move into certain areas, really um, basically <laughs> marginalize those positions. Yeah. I mean, I was gonna say on your question, I think you're completely right. I think uh, uh, we've got great organizations. You know, my friend Kim Bryant, Black Girls Code, you know, we're teaching young folks how to do coding and stuff. But when you actually get into the actual industry, you know, you, you just know the basic level, right? You, you need to, um, there's a program, again, Black Data Scientists, are in great demand, data scientists in general are in great demand. I think to make sure that this not, does not become, to use your term, ghettoized, is that first and foremost, organizations of color need to understand what they're getting into. A lot of organizations of color, years ago, when we talked about STEM, it went from STEM to STEAM, um, it went from computer <laughs> science, and now coding is the next language. We take grants and we try and put these programs together, but we don't understand what's actually going on. What, what, what skills are we trying to do? We have historically black colleges, for example, that do not have um, endowments like MIT, where they're actually training people how to be data scientists. Uh, there are schools where even in uh, data scientists, of 1% of all African Americans are data scientists, and that's probably the most predominant. I literally ran a uh, focus group in Washington and DC. I could not find one African American data scientist in the Bay Area to participate in the focus group, well. and that was out of 30. Um, and so again, I think to your point, <laughs> there's where the jobs are, that's where the money is, but organizations of color are not aware of what that looks like because we weren't trained in that space. Um, if anybody, I'm a sociologist who actually became interested in tech. I didn't start out in tech. When I was in school, we didn't have, you know, we had computer science, I learned how to move the cow, you know, a couple of feet, but for the <laughs> most part, that was about it, right? It was not an area that I was, in, I was involved with. So I think to your point, we have to change the language and we have to get more groups that are working in civil rights, that are looking at these types of programs to places like MIT so they actually understand what is going on. I'll just end with this. The, the, last, the first time I ever entered MIT, I actually stumbled in as part of the um, Innovation Day where the corporations come and there are all these experiments that are going on. And so I was, I was somewhere in the neighborhood and you know, I just walked into the building. And <laughs> there were all of these experiments and I said to somebody, this is very many years ago, 20 years ago, I said, there was not one black student in this and they were selling stuff like two screen TVs, <laughs> and, uh, uh, chips and pillows and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is stuff I see at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody of color that was actually <laughs> doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to see that with MIT, it's a totally different landscape, mm -hmm. right? But I went back and told civil rights leaders and they were like, wow, <laughs> we didn't know that this was actually going on. Mm -hmm. Or I went back to play places like Morehouse and Spelman and they didn't have endowments. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying we've got to educate the civil rights community on the implications of that and stop throwing around these statistics that everybody needs to be in computer science, everybody needs a coding job. You gotta explain where does that lead you, and then people have to be committed to hire you. I have yet to see a program that says, oh, we're gonna give you a million dollars to train 50,000 girls of color, and then 50,000 girls are in the workforce. They old now. Some of those girls started about 10, 20 years ago. They've it's gone so through college, true. they still ain't got a job. <laughs> yes, That's all I'm right. saying. True. Yeah. Yes. I just wanna make one point to this, and let, like underlying this too is that there's this push because we think that all these things are going to actually lead to right. better economic conditions mm -hmm. for us. Um, and the reality is I really, I study race and wealth and that, it is, that is just not the case. Right. And, and to understand one thing, there has never been a black middle class in terms of wealth, ever. Okay, so just like think about that and say, you know, if these are the careers that people want to go to because they're passionate about it, because, um, you know, yes, we need diversity in this. But I think this all this push because it's about money and this dream that there's going to be this great, you know, uh, economic future just doesn't hold water. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't. Yeah. Can we, can we um, so I have a technical background and I'm really passionate about trying to teach adults how to learn machine learning. And my question for Nicole is, what is, do you have any suggestions about how to reach those people that are on the other side of the digital divide who may not have cell phones, who don't mm -hmm. have access to things like Facebook and Twitter? 
you know, that's hard. I mean, because they are truly invisible. I mean, I've, uh, as part of my book, I've been going around the country talking to cities and local people. I literally go to barbershops. I say, what's your internet access like? You know, at the barbershop, it's been great. I got a photo store in Brookings. I'm, I've been to Hartford. I mean, there are spaces where young girls are walking to McDonald's to get internet access because they don't, that's true stuff. Like, it was our Wall Street Journal article about it a couple years ago. I actually saw that girls are doing that. Um, I think the way to teach people about this and the way I learned about algorithmic, I have a paper coming on algorithmic bias, which has been really interesting. Joy, who's here, I love her. Um, I saw her in DC, I thought I was a fangirl. Because I think the way that you teach people about machine learning is you let them know that they are already part of the product. That's how you teach. When they say, oh man, I went to Walmart and you know, they, because if you don't have a device, somebody in your household has a device, Somebody, you just can't do stuff um, without access to technology. It, is, it becomes more and more difficult. So I would say to you, if you want to teach people who are disconnected, you know, go out and let people know or share the stories about what their friends are doing online. They will then pick up, oh, that's why my friend did X at Walmart. But I think the challenge, and this kind of goes back to the question, Michael Harrington is a sociologist, wrote the book called The Other America, which was one of my gospels when I was actually in school. At some point, people who are unemployed or underemployed fall off the rolls, and we don't know who they are. And I think as we get more entrenched in big data, as I tell people when I'm going to say my book, is that they actually don't fall off the rails of who they are. They just don't get access to the new products and services and innovations that will make their life easier. If I'm a single mother and I have to take two buses to get my kid to a doctor, or I have to pay taxi cabs prices as opposed to a discounted Lyft or Uber ride, I have suffered the cost of digital exclusion. Mm -hmm. Because my discretionary income is not taking advantage of the marketplace conveniences that are being afforded through technology. And so I think as an ML person, it's important to get people to see that the intuitive nature of technology doesn't require you to have a degree. It's just how society is becoming in terms of the habits and the conveniences that we're all used to. So start there. It's, it's really difficult to teach somebody who has no limited access, even though most people of color have smartphones, uh, what they're doing. But you can allow people to understand that they've been, become productized in this new economy. Um, hi, I wanted to thank you all. Should I stand up? I'm right here in front of you. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. oh okay. <laughs> We're like, I appreciate the I really appreciate this conversation. Um, and, um, and I appreciate that you focused really heavily on this idea of workers' rights and building it out. Um, and I very much appreciate just pushing back against what I think is a developing rhetoric of a pipeline problem. Are we educating? Are we training? Um, I'm, I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney for 20 years. I've been hearing about pipeline problems <laughs> that whole time and we are swimming in black attorneys, right? So, so I recognize that discourse as an element of structural discrimination. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like there hasn't been a ton of conversation in this panel yet about the reparations side of this, that mm -hmm. on some level, um, are people seeing our innovation and valuing it? We talk about Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a black data scientist who's probably here, that's who, right. who told me that's that right. these aren't profit building spaces. Mm -hmm. There's just venture money that's going in mm -hmm. until autonomous cars show up. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of money mm -hmm. fueling innovation mm -hmm. that doesn't actually even meet the criteria of innovation. Whereas it may be that that money is not as available to black entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I see all of this as just the latest manifestation of a neo-colonial sort of entrenched framework of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, are, are we having, and could we have, or maybe you guys could comment on, are there new conversations about reparations? Are there new conversations about the ways in which we could dismantle those structures? You guys have talked a lot about rights-based structures, and, and I get, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I get it, <laughs> but like, I would be very interested in hearing your thoughts on reparations, on dismantling these structures, on the ways in which um, even these new discourses around who's trained, who's accessed, are actually planting these seeds of uh, the new neocolonial space into our communities and into our, into our professional spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah. I almost feel like you said all the things. <laughs> uh, no, it was great. It was great. I, I mean, I a couple of, a couple of thoughts, and I'm interested to hear what uh, what some of you have to say as well. Um, you know, the the first one is just that I think part of the 
issue is that when people think of automation and new technology, it's like there's this myth that it's some objective thing, mm -hmm. not people making policy for certain reasons. You know, like uh, you know, automating the public assistance in Indiana was done because they wanted to get people off the welfare rolls. I mean, it was very clear. It was very intentional. Um, and so I think that's one of the first things. That, and then secondly, part of why we emphasize this need for us, everyday people, to govern ourselves. And I don't just mean electing people to represent us in Congress. That's great. That's one thing. But that alone is not democracy. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to be able to set the rules and regulations for our own communities, our work sites, our schools, and through that process, then determine what are the ways that we can rebalance the system. Because, you know, even though I made the joke earlier, I mean, reparations is not just, you know, 40 acres and a mule. It's actually a system change. And that system change only comes when we are actually in the position to, to govern, not just elect, not just to vote, but to govern ourselves. Um, and that's a really significant thing. Again, I, I'm in North Carolina. I, I feel like it's a state that's under occupation. I don't know how many of you <laughs> have seen my state. The, you know, there were, uh, when I left there in, uh, well, I won't give, give away my age, a long mm -hmm. time ago, mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. they, you know, there was almost 30% black people basically concentrated in five mm -hmm. of the state house districts. And so that doesn't a democracy make, even if everybody votes. Uh, and so to some degree, I actually think that part of what we're talking about, whether we're talking about automation, the digital economy, the gig economy, whatever, is actually who is in power to govern. Do we actually think we're in power to govern? Because I actually don't think, you know, the rights-based framework was great in the 60s. But what we're actually talking about now is not just trying to get a piece of the pie we're actually trying to change who's around the table, right. you know? And there are people at the table now mm -hmm. who are like, this table is messed up. You don't mm -hmm. even want to be at this table. <laughs> we need to be at a better, we need a different table. And so that requires us to actually be in the position to govern, which requires us to build a very different type of power across right. geographies, mm -hmm. across platforms, to be able to, to vie for that, to contest mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, and I, I would just say on the, just real quick on the VC side, the same type of disparities that we're talking about in terms of workers' rights is the same type on the VC side. Catherine Finney's work in Georgia says a, a black woman entrepreneur who's trying to get investment capital compared to even a white woman is less than 40%. It's, 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 a, it's a very stark uh, disparity in terms of the level of investment that black female um, VC uh, tech companies, tech tar startups get compared to whites. Uh, we also don't have people who are at the core of giving out that money. Um, we've got very wealthy people that do exist in, in among African Americans, most of them are celebrities. You look at the Forbes 500 list. Uh, the extent to which they redistribute that money out is also another question because we're not getting it from the predominant um, capital source. I've got a lot of friends who have created black um, angel investment funds to actually fund that. But when I have conversations with investors, you know, my friend Tristan Walker, it took him a while to build his business. He obviously actually sold it, but he'd put a lot of his own money into it, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all part of the reparation story. Should we actually say, well, we want, you know, $50,000 and, and we do want some investment in black startups? That could be a question, but I think it goes back to structural racism and discrimination. We, unfortunately, in this country cannot change that unless we blow up everything. Absolutely. Seriously. I, it's not going to change. I absolutely agree. I, I think that in the current political climate, the word repar reparations right. is, is probably taboo. I mean, what do, you, what do we actually expect to get out of a request for reparations where we live in a country where we still have a problem apologizing? for slavery. And so my concern is that, you know, in order to really address the situation, exactly what's already been said, we need another table. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the reasons why we have a pipeline issue. Right. You, you get your skills, you get your training, you go, you go through everything you need to go through, but you can't get the job, right. right? And so we have to really be about trying to change how we look at the people at the table in how we man that table, right? Um, I also think that it's, it's not likely that we're gonna get to reparations if we're not dealing with the fact that we're, we have people in power that really should not be in power. Mm. In addition to that, there are things happening in our society like you know robots driving the, the buses. We're not in, in, incredibly clear about how that's gonna impact us. Right. 
robots will be driving children mm -hmm. going to school and coming back. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal with this? Right. And so this whole idea of reparations, yes, it's, it's a great idea. But is it politically viable? Probably not. So what is viable? Right. Well, the, well, the question of then how you actually make yeah. the demand as well. Ab right? Absolutely, right. that's that's like, exactly where I, 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 I want to put it out there though. Sheila Jackson Lee just put on the uh, congressional floor a reparations bill. Uh, no, just, she did. Yeah, yeah. yeah just just a couple weeks ago, we got a, a lynching, lynching band, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in the congressional house. And for those of you that want to make a difference, there are 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, which is the largest voting bloc that currently exists on Capitol Hill. People don't actually recognize that. 55 members means that there could actually be some kind of turnaround or stalling on some type of legislation. So there's a legislative opportunity, but again, we've got members who are still fighting reparations based on 40 acres and a mule. So we've got to be able to bring this proposals is, to them to change the seating mm -hmm. at the table. But this is what I feel like what, what, what you're saying is actually, Dr. Um, Dr. Davis is saying is actually really valuable because part of the question of reparations is what is it? Mm -hmm. Like we actually have to get clear about defining what it is, and I would argue that it's actually a question of ownership. And so, for example, when we, uh, as a government, bailed out General Motors, mm -hmm. that should have been a call for reparations. So, how much of General Motors do we now own? Mm -hmm. Or when we are the predominant uh, uh, consumer base for a certain company, uh, that maybe is being racist. Nissan being one example, where black black people make up the majority of consumers for the Nissan Altima. And the majority, the only two plants in the world where Nissan is not union are the southern plants, which are also majority black. Mm -hmm. So then what's the demand for reparations in that context? It's very different. And I think that's actually the key because if we're talking about getting a different table, like you're saying, then we actually have to really shift what we mean by reparations and really shift what we mean by building wealth if we're going to get back to Anne's point about uh, ownership. I mean, we can still talk about, we, you know, um, a continuum here and what can lead us to a greater truth and reconciliation. When I talk about issues of wealth, we've really never had an understanding of what, how wealth is actually built, how it's actually extracted, mm -hmm. mainly from people of color for the benefit of whites. And you know, without that, we can't even get to what that can look like. However, you know, I've worked with economists where you know, we've been putting forward and advocating for this idea of a young adult trust, which is in some sense could be seen as a form of reparations because it's based on wealth position at birth and mm -hmm. whose wealth position is lowest. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's ways that we can get at that this, but you know, you know, even to have what you were talking about, Dr. David, the truth and reconciliation about um, you know, how did we get here in the first place? We have had no acknowledgement of that and no real understanding of that. We're sitting in here in a city right now, Boston, where the typical white family has about $200,000 in wealth, and the typical black family and okay. other Latino groups have $8. $8, yeah. Right? So, you know, how do we get at that? And I think that this, there are processes. I think there are things that there are ideas out there that people are trying to push that, will, that are over the horizon. We know, over the horizon kinds of approaches. <laughs> I really appreciate when we get to the part of the conversation where we talk about blowing things up. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that question. I have a question. Hello, how are you doing? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Tanisha. I'm from New York, from CJ and AQE. Um, I'm an old soul. So when I think about all of this, it makes me think about our black Wall Streets <laughs> and how we're not learning from our past. Mm -hmm. We're not applying because there was a time right out of slavery where black people did very well and had their own towns and their own bus companies and their own car companies and, and their own hospitals. How do we in 2019 incorporate what we know our ancestors did in the past? So we're not thinking about working for these technology companies, but we're thinking about because how much money do black people spend, African descendants, African descendants spend in this country Trillions. every year? How do we center that conversation around collectively pulling our resources together so we don't work for these companies, but we own these companies? Right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a really good question. 
So as a sociologist, and, I, and I'll kind of go on this point of black wealth, so my dissertation was on um, the black middle class in Chicago. And so to your point, um, my sister, you know, at that time we had segregation and we had no choice. Right, so black metropolis, um, you know, doctors, lawyers that came out of the African American community primarily came out because no one would service us. <laughs> and so we had no choice but to actually create those. When integration came, those uh, units became, again, decentralized, much like we're seeing here. And we actually came to a point as African Americans that because we had a, you know, for some of us, it was a birthright to be here post slavery. I mean, many of us, our families, and only a few generations removed from slavery. There was a feeling of a birthright that we actually came to this country, we deserve the merits that everybody else has. Um, my dissertation dated uh, Obama, and in that I spoke about the black middle class. My parents were civil rights beneficiaries. My mother was uh, one of 15, my father one of six. Very poor, un their parents were uneducated, but they had the opportunity to go to HBCUs at the time, uh, become a teacher, my father was able to become an architect. I remember when I wanted to go to school, I wanted to go to Howard University, and my parents said, no, we worked too hard for you to go to Howard University. You gotta go to a predominantly white school. And I'm not gonna tell my age, but it was around that time when my elementary school was desegregated. Mm -hmm. And I was on a bus headed to another part of town in Westchester County in New York. I say that to say, we as African Americans have not recovered from that period. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is still a mounting, um, and, and I think you can attest to this as a race and wealth person as well, there's still mounting confusion as the extent to which you should actually manifest this collective destiny versus you know, going out and finding a job in Ernst & Young, making a lot of money and being able to provide for your family. There's still a lot of angst, whether or not I should live in uh, the heart of an African-American community, raise my kids there or send them to a predominantly black school, or if I should actually have them afford the benefits of being in a, a predominantly uh, integrated school or living in an integrated neighborhood. What we're seeing now, I would say, is the consequence of that decision. I live in Washington, I live in Washington, D.C., outside of Washington, D.C. The gentrification that is happening in New York and other places of communities that used to be predominantly black have shifted. Now we can't even make the choice to go back and live there. Our parents are being foreclosed on in terms of the housing. African Americans, in terms of wealth, can't even pass down that house to their kids because the kids can't afford it. The glass ceiling hit many of us, and we realized that we could not work in those corporations, that we were not gonna get beyond that. The intersectionality of being black and female really played a number on us. Then we had this black president come in and gave us hope, and now we're right back where we started in terms of the rollback of policies. So I think that there's this discussion to your point about can we get there, what happened? It is a mix of the sister's question. There are policy directives um, under media bro broadcast ownership before Newt Gingrich turned back the minority tax credit, we had many more stations that were owned by people of color because of tax credit. Once that was rolled back, today we have 3% of full power stations are owned by African Americans in this country. So we don't control the narrative anymore. Our schools are subjected to political uh, changes and policy changes based on what, you know, what we're seeing now in the educational system. All of that has to do with, I think a lot of we're talking about, our involvement in voting, our involvement in where policy directives are, our love of ourselves, <laughs> and what we actually, you know, how we make choices and negotiate that. The challenges, and I'm a, I'm a parent of a 16-year-old and 12-year-old, my son, Post Obama, has grown up in a different society. So I don't know if we can actually go back to that, right? Because he's got a different group of friends, a different mindset about how life is, although I still had to teach my son what to do if he was stopped by the police at 15 years old, mm -hmm. because he's a black male. You see what I mean? So there's many respects which I, I, as a sociologist, I always find this interesting. We took two steps forward to go two steps back and then two steps forward. I'm one of two African-American scholars at Brookings, full time. They've been around for 100 years. Lots of things have gone on, but it's the responsibility of people like us and people like you to bring somebody up because that's the only way you're gonna shatter the ceilings that are in place and to vote and create policy directives that demand the things that we're talking about. And to be more specific, I, I, I love your, your comment. Um, to be more specific, particularly re with regard to love, let's talk about trust, mm -hmm. right? When immigrant groups come here, they are primarily aided by the people in their community. And that is a long-standing tradition, right? And so when you see, for instance, Asian um, immigrants come over, 
in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. There's a whole Chinatown where a lot of people who cannot speak English work. There are nail salons where a lot of people who speak a little English work. That's communities supporting communities. Korean communities, lending money, right? Uh, African you know, uh, immigrants lending money to one another, right? There are examples of all of this. We just have to take these examples seriously. Right. But it's so hard to take, I, I, I agree with you, yeah. but I think we have to be mindful that African Ameri Africans in America where people via the transatlantic slave trade, where all of that was dismantled. And there's this, there's, I was talking to somebody, an Uber driver the other day who was from Africa, and we were just talking about like wealth and all this other stuff, you know. Okay. And one of the things that he said, this last thing, mm -hmm. he said was, he said, why can't black people get it together? You all have all of this strength in number to actually do stuff. I think it does go back to the communal understanding that we all are actually part of the same group of people, the same type of experiences, but you cannot govern from a point of oppression you got to govern from a point of power. And until we change that for African Americans, our history books cannot start from slavery. They have to start and go back to civilizations. You will then realize that you have that strength to do the love that you're talking about. That is the most difficult part about being a parent. Because every day my kids come home, they don't start from a point of love. i got to give them that, right? They start from what their teachers have told them that then, you know, Puts, even, I'm just, I gotta just say this, I know I'm taking up time. Even in math, young African American boys, if they are not encouraged to go into math, by the time they are in sixth grade, they will walk through life realizing that they cannot do it. Because they are already starting from a point where they, I have a son like that, he ain't gonna be a STEM person, he's an English person. Because some math teacher told him he could not do it. And every day I gotta tell him he could do it. So we have to reframe how we think about ourselves to go back to loving ourselves. Absolutely. That's all I'm saying. This so. is why we I We gotta, we all have like five minutes left and there are people with microphones. Um, Great, so we have two last questions. The first one is with this gentleman right here. Hi there, uh, my name is Ben Davis and uh, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, the question for the panel is, um, how do we prepare for what we can't see or what we can't envision? As African Americans, we know that we're underrepresented in many skill sets to effectively participate in the digital economy. Um, it feels like if we're always trying to prepare for what we can see, we're going to be behind the eight ball. As an example, <clears throat> in the early 1900s, when the car production came online, folks that manufactured saddles for horses or horseshoes knew that their jobs were going to be displaced. And so they appropriately prepared for jobs in factories. But the impact of the automobile industry opened up so many new industries, such as the fast food industry with drive through feels like if we're always just thinking about what we can see, we're always going to be behind the eight ball. So how do we think 50, 20 years into the future for things that we do not know? Well, one of the things I want to, when I was talking about UBI, and if you, if you think about the originators of who was thinking about our economic structure at that time, largely it was black women. It was black women who came out of sharecropping, our families came out of sharecropping, and yeah. um, who started the National Welfare Rights Organization, who really were demanding something very different, understanding what this economy was yielding. You know, what they were demanding and what they were talking about really was um, caretaking, and really about the fact that, you know, women should have the freedom to take care of their families, right? And, and really push this as kind of a new economic framework. And a lot of people don't really think about those women. They sometimes think, yes, it was Martin Luther King. It was really, it was those women who were really actually pushing Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Jr. to say, look at us and, and think about our lives. I do believe that we as oppressed people do understand. We are the canaries in the mind. We do understand what's ahead. Mm -hmm. the, ac the issue is what is our access to power what is our access to capital to realize what we already see and the fact that it is very difficult, you know, as we sit up and have these conversations to really just even us in our fields, 
every day people think I'm crazy for talking about the ideas that I'm talking about, right? So, to, it, so I think the idea, the thing is, is that to recognize that we, the reason we're behind the eight ball has, has nothing to do with our imagination. Mm -hmm. I think there's a rich creativity and imagination by oppressed people. It's our ability to access the power, be, have the seat at the tables where the decisions are being made. And that's what we're trying, that's what we have to push for right now. That's right. Um, um, Can you also add to think out of the box, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. That's Washington. Right. That's right. That is one of the most famous pieces that you can look at. What would be best for the Negro man? Same thing. You better have the scholarly and you better have the hands. That's too. right. And I grew up in a household where that was the case. My dad only demanded the best of race, but also you're looking at a sister also that can change tires, she can change her oil. And there's something to be done when you are raising your children in a household to let them know that they need both. Because you never know, you may have to be that person that's going to plaster some sheetrock one day, mm -hmm. or be the person that's going to sit and create an app. So I think that when you say, how do you prepare, you got to have both. Mm -hmm. And you can use the scholars of our past and our ancestors to really move forward with that thing. Uh, we have one last question and about a minute left. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just uh, listening to all of this and then uh, considering the fact that we need to create a whole new table, um, I'm interested in the creation of a network of worker cooperatives for the liberation of black people. And could you talk about the role of worker cooperatives and specifically workers owning their their businesses collectively in that way and democratic processes in that way as a way to, uh, I guess, navigate the whole necessity, like not making it a necessity to have a seat at the table because we are creating our own tables? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start and say that, you know, I think historically people have seen cooperative movements and union movements as uh, kind of opposing factions or opposing solutions to the issue when they when they aren't. In fact, many unions actually own and run cooperatives in different places, including Cincinnati, and uh, certainly the famous Mondragon example in Spain, where again, the point is to govern, is to actually set up situations where we own the company, we own the production, and we're governing ourselves and managing it ourselves. Um, and likewise, with this, as you're talking specifically about workplace cooperatives, which there's a whole slew of examples of, but then of course, looking at uh, housing and other forms that we come together to uh, manage and own economic conditions of our lives and to govern the economic conditions of our lives. So I actually think that um, there is value in, in paying attention to and figuring out how we insert capital and investments into black-led cooperatives and worker-owned cooperatives. The, Na the National Black Worker Center Network would be a great place to start, particularly in the industry of construction mm -hmm. because of how they've been able to make really strategic interventions in cities to get black workers into certain jobs, to be valued at a certain level, and to set, basically change standards and regulations in, in the industry. That said, you know, we live in a global economy, and you know, there have been a lot of experiences. The sister over here mentioned some of our previous businesses in the past, like certainly in North Carolina, we had the Haytai in Durham and Wilmington, where there, these were black-owned cities with black-owned businesses, and, and some were cooperative, some were just uh, small companies, small businesses. Um, but in a global economy, if we aren't taking stock of the relationship between what we're doing and what's happening in that industry overall, then we're, we're going we're gonna to get either literally wiped out, like the communities that I was a uh, part of, where they literally burnt them to the ground, or we're going to be left behind. And so part of what we ultimately need to, to do, whether it's through a cooperative, through a union, through our own businesses and enterprises, is consistently ask the question, this gets to the brother's question right before about how do we predict, you don't have to know the future to ask the right question. The question is always who benefits, what's in our interest, how are we making sure that whatever happens is going to actually improve the lives of the people involved and not, and not undermine us or write us out, and particularly for black people. But to, to prove, and I think this is really important for us as we leave here today, to prove that what is going to benefit black workers will ultimately benefit the entire workforce and what will hurt black workers will and has and continues to undermine mm -hmm. the entire workforce. Yeah. Thank you so much, Smiley, mm -hmm. for that wrapping comment. <laughs> um, thank you to the panelists for being here.